powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry. morning for your holiness for your mercy for your grace for your love for us praise you father god open our hearts and our minds this morning to your word just ask that you be blessed in jesus precious name amen immediately following the service and i don't remember if joetta said anything on this or not but immediately following the service, we're going to need some help. She did mention that we have Slap Happy Comedy coming in tonight. We need to convert the sanctuary into a place, a space where we will be able to watch and engage and have the concert. And so we have a plan. And Kim Walters is the commander-in-chief of that plan. Okay? So here's, here's how it's going to work. And now, if, if you are not physically able, we do not ask that you remain here and, and put yourself into a position of danger because we do not want you to be injured. We do not want you to be stepped on. If you happen to be what we would call a little person, uh, it would probably be best if you weren't in this room at that time. But Kim is going to direct us. If you are physically able, what we're going to do is we're going to take down all the chairs and then we're going to bring in all kinds of tables and then we're going to put chairs around the tables and Kim has the plan for that. So you won't be, if you come to me and ask me a question, what am I, I'm going to say, you need to go talk to Kim. Okay. I am not in charge of this. Kim. So I've already talked to Kim. She knows that I'm putting her in charge of that. So if you're able, we would love to help. It's not going to be a lot of work because we're going to be able to crank it with this many people that we have to be able to help. So I just wanted to make that clear. That's going to be right before we go into the small group connect times. Now, if you are a coffee addict, not that we like to use the word addicts in church, but we just did. If you need the coffee, like you just can't function without it, by all means, go get yourself some coffee first because we don't want anyone passing out from lack of caffeine. 
It's difficult in our culture, in our, in our world, even in, in our small lives, and small community lives, it's difficult in this church to keep perspective, isn't it? You know, we kind of default into certain ways, and we, we, when it comes to perspective, we find ourselves, wow, I just can't get beyond the way I see things right now. And sometimes that's, that's, that's a reality. I mean, we see things, very serious things, and it's, uh, yeah, I can understand why we can't get around them. Here are a few instances where someone ran into a little bit of trouble. You know, I think he should have been watching where he was going, but with a slightly different perspective... You see it? He's not really falling down to the bottomless pit. He's laying on the road. Different perspectives. Hey, a boat, land. <laughs> like, so sometimes, sometimes we can't see things beyond the way that we've always been looking at them, and yet the other person on the other side will see things totally differently. If you're married. There's likely been a moment, maybe one or two, where you've seen things from a different perspective. And then you end up finding that you're having this conflict because all you're really trying to do is convince the other person your perspective and how maybe your perspective is either right or minimally has value, right? Sarah and I have never had that. This one is not a great picture. It's the best I could find. So look at this picture, okay? This is basically, it's, it's a realty. You know, they're, they're showing this house. It's got a beautiful pool. There's another picture of the pool. I mean, it just looks fabulous. It's like if you're looking for a house with a pool, this is your house until <laughs> a slightly different perspective changes everything, doesn't it? That's fascinating. Where did they find such a little person? That's the kind of little person we don't want in here. They'll get stepped on and crushed. It's fascinating what we can do with, with perspective. You know, it's kind of like this idea, in any situation, we can oftentimes, we hear some jokes about it, but the idea of there's always some good news and there's always some bad news. They, they use the phrase, you know, there's every dark cloud has a silver lining. Well, here's some, some good news, bad news. It says, the doctor said, I have some good news and I have some bad news. And the patient, of course, would like to know, I want to know the good news, because anytime your doctor says they have bad news, you probably don't really want to hear the bad news. So let's start with the good news. And so what is the good news? And the good news is that the test you took show that you have 24 hours to live. That's the good news. What? What do you mean? That's the good news? Well, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is I forgot to give you a call yesterday <laughs> and let you know. So, that would be bad news. One more. A large passenger train was crossing the country. After they had gone some distance, one of the two engines broke down. No problem, the engineer thought, and carried on at half power. Farther on down the line, the other engine broke down, and the train came to a standstill. The engineer decided he should inform the passengers about why the train had stopped and made the following announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some good news, and I have some bad news. The bad news is that both engines have failed and will be stuck here for some time. The good news is we are not on an airplane. <laughs> I remember a number of years ago, uh, Pastor Phil, when he was pastoring here, he shared this story about the seven blind mice and how they, they all encountered the same thing. You know, and some would go up to it and they would, they would feel it. They couldn't see it, so they would feel it and they touch it. Oh, they're touching something that's just really solid. It's really big. It must be a wall. Another guy came to this part of, of this item and he, he kind of felt it. And he could, well, it's just round and it's long. It must, I must be feeling a tree. Another one came into this other part of, of this item and, and started, oh, it's long and it's, it's thin. It must be, must be a rope. And the other one kind of comes to the, the front of this thing, and he, he's feeling it, and it's just, oh, it's kind of big and chunky. It must be like a hose or something. And the, all the while, all seven of these blind mice come at this item from a different perspective, and what they're really feeling is an elephant, you know, and the different parts of it. And so as we come to our lives, we find ourselves encountering with a number of different perspectives. And what we're going to find today, this is an amazing story. It's a story we actually talked about briefly, not quite this part of it, but it's a story we talked briefly back last April, right as we came into Easter. Because we talked about this idea of the resurrection. And what we're dealing with today is a man by the name of Lazarus. And what we're going to see in this story is Jesus has this perspective of really this true what's going on. But there's different characters that we're going to find that have this different perspective as we go through this story. And it's going to carry some weight. And it's just going to be an absolutely amazing and powerful moment. And I want you guys all to see it. When Jesus' perspective gets revealed to the rest of the people. 
And we won't see it come to fruition until we finish off this chapter, but it's just, it's an amazing picture of how different people come at different perspective when Jesus has something that's above and beyond all of them. So here's the story in John chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Uh, recently, what we did is we had just gone through John uh, chapter 9. Jesus had just pulled away from those Jewish leaders. Remember, they were ready to stone him. Okay, They're ready to crush him. They want to kill him. He pulled away for about three or four months is what's believed, and he went back. Remember last week we talked? He went back to where it all began. He went back to where he was baptized by John the Baptist, where he was baptizing just north of the De- Dead Sea there. And while he was there, he's with the people He had longed to see those Jewish leaders come to faith in him, to have the belief in him, and they did not. He's back in this area, and while he is there, many people are coming to him, and it says in the scriptures, many people believed in him there. I mean, just an amazing scene. And so now that we transition, he's still in that region, he's still in that area, and while he's there, this is what happens. So a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany. I'll show you where that is in a little bit. The village of Mary and her sister Martha. So we have these three characters right off the get-go. We have Lazarus, we have Mary, and we have Martha. This Mary, this is what it says in verse 2, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Well, that actually takes place in John chapter 12. We haven't even hit on that yet. And this is what happens. So then Mary took out a pint of pure nard, so a pint, which is a fair amount, really, of this expensive perfume, And uh, she poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. And if you recall this story, and we'll talk about this in a number of weeks, if you recall this story, one of the disciples in particular was really upset that she had just wasted a full pint of this expensive perfume because that could have been sold and given to the poor, or it could have been sold and put in the pocketbook, and I could have pillaged out of the pocketbook. It's really the idea that was going on that. We'll deal with that in a number of weeks. But this is the same group of people, Mary Martha and Lazarus. There's one other incident where we find Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Lazarus is only mentioned in John chapters 11 and 12. But there's obviously a significant and strong relationship here with Jesus and John. We'll, or, uh, Jesus and Lazarus. We'll see that in a little bit. So in Luke chapter 10, here's the story, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a man named, oh, excuse me, that was a mistake. A woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary. So here are those two sisters who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So here it is. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to what he is saying. And Martha is distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. You know, and so there's this perspective even there, okay, as to what's Mary and Martha. And we're not dealing with that here today. But this is what we're looking at. So here's Jerusalem. That's where Jesus had been when the people were ready to stone him. He had been in Jerusalem. He had been teaching the people. The Jewish leaders had been confronting him. On a number of occasions, they picked up stones, and they're ready to throw stones at him to kill him. And we have two Bethanies here, right here and here. And this is the one that is believed to be the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And one of the biggest reasons is is the fact that it's so close to Jerusalem, we're going to see the volatility of the situation as we go through the scripture today. So Jesus had been up and over in this area here, and so it's believed that wherever he's going to be sent for is somewhere in this area, several days away from this Bethany. Okay? So here we go. So... The sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So there's obviously this strong relationship that Jesus has with Lazarus. So much so, in fact, that they actually have to send for for Jesus. And they're sending for Jesus in a very volatile situation. Mary and Martha would have known the danger that Jesus would have had to engage in coming back into that area, being so close to Jerusalem where all these Jewish leaders hated him and wanted to kill him. You know, this, this is like, you know, if you inviting one of your best friends to a football game, all right? And what you say, hey, let's go to a football game. Let's dress all in purple for Vikings, and let's go into the heart of Green Bay, and we'll be the only ones wearing purple. You know, there's, there's kind of like this, you got to approach that with some caution, all right? In this situation here, Mary knows that this is way bigger than any kind of a football game. This is life and death, and she obviously sees her brother who is extremely sick and recognizes the fact that there's only one hope for my brother here right now, and that's if Jesus comes, 
Even as dangerous as that might be for Jesus, I need him to come because he's the only one that's going to be able to do anything here. You know, one of the interesting parts of this is, you know, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they're believed to be pretty young. They believe that their parents are dead. Lazarus is believed to be the youngest of the three. He's a younger brother. And so realistically, with his sickness, he is probably an extremely young man. And so even in our culture, you have a young man who, who dies, whether it's a car accident or any circumstance like that. It's a tragedy. You know, if you go to a funeral and it happens to be a young person, you find that those funerals have way more people, which is isn't it? it's interesting. And I understand that, the, the tragedy aspect of it. But the older we get, you think that we'd have more. It doesn't really make sense, but it is what it is. But you have that kind of tragedy. I mean, the same would have been true in this culture. For a young man to pass away like that, that's a big deal. And so Mary and Martha are looking at Lazarus is sick. Their parents are dead. He's going to kind of be the breadwinner. This is a serious issue for them. And they see no choice but to actually actually ask Jesus to come back and to help. So watch what happens. Here we go, verse 4. So when he heard this, so they sent messengers to go find Jesus. They find Jesus, and this is his response. He says, this sickness will not end in death. Yes! Jesus has it, you know? There's some encouraging words for anyone who would hear that. It's like, well, this sickness is not going to end in death. His disciples would have been there to hear it. The messenger would have been there to hear it. And this is, this is good news. I mean, this is, an, this is super encouraging for anyone who would, would be there. But catch the second part of the verse. He says, no, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And that's a little bit cryptic for them right now. We're going to have that revealed to us in a little bit. But I want you to understand, I want you to grasp this, grasp this idea. It's for God's glory. Whatever is about to happen, whatever Jesus decides to make happen, it's for his glory and to glorify the Son through it. You know, in other words, what Jesus is really saying is that this is not going to end in death, but I want you guys to understand there's a bigger picture going on here. This is the first time I'm alluding to it. Whatever happens, it's going to be okay because of the big picture that I know. You know, no matter what Mary and Martha think, no matter what the messengers think, no matter what the disciples think, Jesus is already kind of laying the foundation saying, whatever happens, it's going to be okay. All right? I'm just kind of laying that out there for you guys right now. And he'll hit on that a little bit more as we go. But I think it's so beneficial for us to see. You know, God's glory is God's glory. You know, we, we can, in a sense, we sing songs about glorifying him, but what we're going to see here this morning as well is God has already been glorified. He, there, he cannot be any more glorious than he is, but what we'll see, it's kind of played out for us, is this idea of that glory will be opened up to us so that we actually get to see it. Does that make sense? So, for instance, you remember, remember the story of Moses? When he goes up onto the mountain, he receives the Ten Commandments. God had shown him the glory. This is the second set, and he comes down the mountain with these tablets. Okay, And this is what, what we find here. So in Moses, in Exodus chapter 34, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he's got these tablets that God himself wrote on. He had this encounter with God. He came down with the tablets of the covenant of the law in his hands, and he was not aware. Moses didn't even realize that this was the case. He was not aware that his face was radiant. His, literally, he's glowing in the dark. All right, you turn the lights off, no moon, whatever the case is, I believe his face is still shining light, if you will. Because he had spoken with the Lord. He had been face to face with God. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Look at how uh, Paul talks about this event in 2 Corinthians. He says, now, this is just amazing. I want you to grasp this because what we have here, as amazing as that picture was, Paul's laying out there's something even better. Okay? Are you ready for this now? So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, this is what it says in verse 7. Paul's writing this to all of the churches, all right? Paul. Paul was the one who was a persecutor of Christians, and then God revealed himself to him, and in fact, was blinded by God's glory, God's radiance, if you will, and then had his sight restored. And so now Paul writes this, he says, now if the ministry that brought death, that is referring to the law, you know, which, which brought condemnation because no one could keep the law which was engraved in the letters in stone, right? So the Ten Commandments, if, if that ministry of death came with glory, which it did because we saw Moses' face, so that the Israelites could not even look steady on Moses' face. I mean, that was amazing glory on these Ten Commandments. And Paul's saying, yeah, that, as amazing as that was, it still brought death. And as amazing as that was, look at this, because of its glory, transitory though it was, temporary, 
Will not the ministry of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, be even more glorious? So what, what Paul is saying is, you have this glory that, that God revealed through Moses with these tablets. It was amazing. And it's nothing compared to what Jesus has done and given us in the Holy Spirit. So if the ministry that brought condemnation, that's the ministry that brought the law, okay, that which we cannot keep, if the ministry that this law, we can't even fulfill it, we can't even keep it, was so glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness. Get this? For what was glorious, I know it's a lot of glory. You staying with me here? I'm trying to go slow. For what was glorious has no glory now. In other words, that Old Testament, the law, comparatively, there's no glory in it. A comparison. I'm not saying that it wasn't true, okay? But it's a comparison issue. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? A couple more verses. We're jumping, excuse me, we're jumping to 14. But their minds, this is, this is the Jewish leaders he's kind of referring to, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. Okay, the God's glory is there, but there's this veil that prevents them from seeing God's glory for all that it is. This veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. And we will all, who with unveiled faces, now this is a comparison to Moses, those who choose to follow Christ. And we will all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So it's, it's like this. I have this. There's a veil here. God's glory is God's glory. It, it exists. We can't glorify him any more than he has already been glorified. But what ends up happening is when we choose to follow Christ, this veil is removed and then the light suddenly revealed. Did you catch that? The light didn't get brighter. The veil that was covering it is then removed. And when we are followers of Christ, when we make that decision, okay, the glory is still there. Oh man, Jesus, I recognize now that I need you. This veil is pulled away. And then what it says, if we look at the scripture, our faces become like Moses' face, if you will, in a sense, where we start to shine like stars in the universe to those that are around us. I mean, is that not just amazing? You know, you, you grasp what, what's kind of going on here. And so what we're finding is, in this passage that we're looking at in John chapter 11, I want you to grasp this. That's what John has in mind. That's what Jesus is getting at when he talks about this idea of this will not end in death but it is for God's glory. It is for the glorifying of the Son. In other words, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to take a veil, I'm going to peel it back. And you're going to see something totally amazing when I peel this veil back, and it's going to blow your socks off. And he's setting these people up because he cares so much more for them than their hurt. And we're going to see that as we continue on this morning. And I know that sounds harsh, but here we go. So John 1, a couple of passages right from the very beginning. John lays it out for us in John chapter 1, verse 14. We've, we've built, dwelt on this verse, and it's good to, for us to revisit it real briefly. The Word became flesh, that is Jesus. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace. So when Jesus came, his glory was, again, revealed. All right, God's glory was revealed. That veil was taken away. And I love the songs that we were singing this morning. It was all about his glory. And, and one even talks about this idea. When Jesus died, it tore that temple veil, that temple curtain in two, it ripped it open, revealing God's glory that had been only stationed there for that, that high priest on that one day of the year. Boom, there it is. And all of God's glory is revealed for anyone who's willing to say, yep, I'm willing to look at it. And also then John chapter 2. This is amazing. We're going to touch on this briefly. What Jesus did in Canaan. Remember when Jesus went to that wedding? This is the first miracle that's specified in the, in the Gospels. He goes to this wedding. They run out of wine. Remember? And Mary, Jesus' mother, says, Jesus, they're out of wine. And, and Jesus says, woman, why do you 
you know, concern me. My time has not come. Remember all this? This is wonderful. Okay, so it says, what Jesus did here in Cana, that's where this took place, that's what it's referring to, of Galilee, was the first of the signs through which he revealed, in other words, this is the first time where he took and he pulled away the veil to let people see who I am, that I am, in fact, who I say I am. Here's your first sign. I'm pulling away. Watch me. I will turn water into wine to reveal the glory of God. And his disciples, catch this, this is so huge, believed in him. Why does God reveal his glory? And we're going to see it this morning so that we will believe in him. So good. Okay. So here we go. John chapter 11. You know, it's interesting because what we see here is the same request, in a sense, in a nutshell. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and uh, Mary, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So Jesus has this great love for them. But this request was from, from his sisters to say, go get Jesus, tell Jesus that the one he loved is sick. They didn't say, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. We want you to come back and heal him. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. Likewise, Mary, Jesus' mother, says they're out of wine. The, there's an implication there, but they're not saying, Jesus, I need you to turn some water into wine. You know, in this case, that first case is, why do you concern me? Well, this one, Jesus is desperately close desperately close to where his time has come. And so his response is much different, but the, the overall goal is very much the same. So now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary. The interesting word here, the word love, is the, in the Greek, it's the word agape. And this is the, this is the word, and we see it all the time when we look through, through the scriptures. This is the one where it says, I will love you no matter what. Okay, you could spit in my face, and it would not change the way that I love you. I mean, it's just that crazy of a kind of love. You know, it's the same word that Jesus used when he talked to Peter and said, Peter, this is after Peter had denied him three times, right at the end of his ministry, says, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you love me more than anything? And Peter responded back to him and says, Jesus, I phileo you. I love you as a brother. We're going to get to that in a few weeks. But it's just this fascinating shift in words that Peter was not willing to say because Peter knew he already blew it was not willing to say, yes, I love you no matter what, because I've already shown you that I didn't. Now, we'll get to that. John chapter 21 on that one. So here we go. So when Jesus, who loves these people, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, oh, I love you guys. I want to be there for you. I want to do whatever I can. Stayed there two more days. And to us, that's just like, is that how we demonstrate love? You know, let's be honest here. If you have a child who is ill, and you need to get them to the doctor because you know that they're so ill that they are going to not make it. Well, I'll give it a couple of days. Well, I'll talk to you on Tuesday. You know, we'll see how you're doing on Tuesday. You know, it just it doesn't fit with our culture. It doesn't fit with our mindset. And yet Jesus does this, and he does this for a very specific purpose. And I don't want us to miss that purpose. Because in the same way that he healed that blind man, remember that blind man that, that was blind from birth? In a sense, it wasn't his sin. It wasn't his parents' sin. It was for this purpose that I could heal you so that God's glory would be revealed. And so then when God's glory is revealed, that people will believe. And Jesus has something very similar in mind. I, mean, I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm going to say it now in case I forget to say it later. There's a reality here. So when, when the messenger is sent from Mary and Martha, it probably took about a day to get to Jesus. Jesus stays there two more days, and then he's got one more day to get back totaling four days. What we're going to see, not today, but in, in the future sermons as we go on through John chapter 11, that Lazarus is dead for four days. So likely, Lazarus died right shortly after that messenger left. And that's important to note that Jesus' delay did not cause this man's death. However, what was believed in that culture was after four days, that spirit would leave the person and they were dead dead, not just mostly dead. You know, because you could be mostly dead all day, you know. And so the reality was it was some, some assuring the fact that he was dead. In fact, after four days, body decomposition would be occurring, you know. You think, you know, you know some people who should be using deodorant more, like we talked about last week. Okay, this is worse, okay. So there's this idea that Jesus waits these two days to ensure so that everyone's going to know that this wasn't just an accident. He's been dead for four days. This isn't just, you know, oh, yeah, well, maybe he wasn't really dead. I mean, this is, this is serious, and so he stays two more days. It's interesting. I you know I'm jumping all over my notes, so it's okay. But this is important to say as well. Jesus' delay 
can be looked at on this passage as an act of coldness, as an act of unconcern. But I believe the reality of it is Jesus' two days extra is an act of love. It is an act of passionate love because what happens in these two days is as sure as it Lazarus is sick, and then what you're going to see is you're going to see something just totally mind-blowing because he's going to reveal God's glory in such a way that people will believe in him. And that's the bigger picture, okay? So verse 7 says, And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. That is really where it gets good because these people, these disciples, already know the dangers of what's going on in Jerusalem. Okay? They get that. And so we have Mary and Martha's perspective recognizing the fact that only Jesus can help Lazarus. We have Lazarus's perspective is like, well, I'm really not feeling very good here, sisters. Oh, wait, maybe I'm dead. And then we have this other picture of the disciples who are going like, you know, I'm glad he said what he did about that this isn't going to end in death because I don't want to go back to Jerusalem because it's dangerous in Jerusalem. And Jesus, I don't think you should go back to Jerusalem. And here he says in verse 7, guess what, guys? Two days are up. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Okay? We're going back to Judea. And they reply, it's like, uh, wait a minute, time out. But Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews were trying to stone you. They tried to kill you, and yet we're going back. In other words, do you have any, I mean, you know. Why would you do this? This goes totally against. Their perspective is, you're sending us into the lion's den, and we're going to be killed. You're going to be killed. You're not making it out of there again. I don't know how you made it out the first time. Jesus answered, and this is a little bit cryptic, and there's two, two ways I want us to grasp this one. Jesus answered, and there are, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. So two, two pieces I want us to kind of grasp out of this. One is that, guys, don't you realize, remember when I said, I am the light of the world? All right? You're walking in the light. Where I go is the light. You guys are Okay. You're, you're, you're locked in here. We talked about that a few weeks ago with that idea of I have you in my grasp and you're not going to escape it. But here we are. I am the light. As you walk in the light, as you walk with me, you're going to be just fine. But there's another piece to it here where it talks about there's only 12 hours of daylight. What Jesus is believed to be getting at here is this idea of I only have so much time to do what it is that I'm supposed to do and that's to reveal God's glory, to pull that veil away so more people will believe. My time is limited. And now is the time where I have to use what I have so that more people will see that glory, more people will believe. And so there's those two pieces that we're looking at in here. In verse 11, it says, After he had said this, he went on to tell them, oh, this, is, this is so funny, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to go wake him up. Okay? You know, and, and, and the disciples, now they may have known what he was talking about because this idea of sleep, actually, uh, the word cemetery comes from a Greek word that actually refers to a place of sleep, you know, and so it wasn't uncommon to refer to someone's death as being sleep. So the disciples may have been up on it. However, look at their reaction here. The disciples said, Lord, well, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. All right, in other words, let him sleep it off. He'll, he's getting some rest. He's going to be okay. You already said this isn't going to end in death. So just let him sleep. Why do we have to go and wake him? You know, it's... We're okay to stay away from Judea. Jesus had, of course, been speaking about his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Verse 14 says, So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And you have to come to this point of like, okay, the disciples had just heard Jesus say, this will not end in death. And now, Jesus, you're telling us, Lazarus is dead. That doesn't add up. There's a problem here. Okay? And then what we find... And for your sake, Jesus says, I'm glad I was not there. Look at this, so that you may believe. Why is he doing this? So that they will believe. Why does Jesus reveal his glory? So that we will believe. Why does Jesus heal people? So that you will believe. Why does Jesus not heal people? So that you will believe. I want you to understand where he's going at with this. And then Jesus says, but let us go to him. I love Thomas's. You always look at, at doubting Thomas. This is, this is courageous of Thomas. Look at his, his response in verse 16. Then Thomas, who was also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, all right, let us go also that we may die with him. Do you see that perspective? They fully believe that they're going to their death right now. And they say, all right, we're going to go wake up Lazarus. He's already dead. 
You said it wasn't going to end in death. We're just going to go and we'll be dead. And they see that. That's, that's the conclusion. So you see their perspective. They see the danger. Mary and Martha see the loss of hope that, La- that Jesus is their only hope. Lazarus has died. They're hurting. They're in pain. We haven't seen that yet. We'll see that as we continue on to chapter 11. But there is great pain here. And Jesus cares about their pain, but he cares something more than just about their pain. He cares about their belief. And he cares about the fact that God's glory will be revealed, that his glory will be revealed, so that people will come to believe that he is who he says he is. And it's a mind-blowing picture of perspective. And so often in our culture, we lose perspective. Myself, all the time. We get so focused on what we feel is important, I can't get beyond my own view of what's going on in my day right now to be able to look at anything even close to what God would be having for me. Jesus' bigger perspective is something like this. Mary and Martha, disciples, all of you guys, I love you so much that I let Lazarus die. And they'd be going like, what? That doesn't make any sense. He says, in a sense, I, what I'm doing is I, I'm doing something so much bigger than making you happy. What I'm doing is so much more important than making sure that you have what you want here so that you're content and happy. I did not wait two days because I didn't care. I waited two days because I care so deeply. It was more important for them to have God's glory unveiled in front of them than to suffer the pain and temporary loss of death. I know that's hard to say, but it's, it's, it's a reality. And we can't help but ask God then, okay, look at this situation, Mary and Martha, how can they not ask, Jesus, did you even care because you didn't come right away? And you let him, even if you had come right away and he was already dead, it would have told us something. It would have told us that you cared. Instead, Jesus waited two more days. How in the world does that demonstrate that you cared? You didn't make any effort. You waited two more days. And what we see is Jesus revealing himself. Ah, Fabulous. Fabulous. You've got to remember, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, the disciples, they are all Jesus' precious sheep, like we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And his delay is a delay of love. A veil is being removed in order to show God's glory. For something bigger is at stake, than, and it is bigger than death. It is their belief, and it is our belief. A couple of passages I want to share as we kind of conclude and wrap, wrap things up here. In Habakkuk, chapter 1, Habakkuk was a prophet around the same time as Jeremiah, kind of a lesser-known prophet. But look how he starts his prophetic book of Habakkuk. See if you can relate it all to what Habakkuk is saying. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? It feels like I'm talking to a ceiling, and there's nothing coming back. Or how long do I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? In other words, why do I have to keep looking around and see all of this injustice Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? In other words, I feel like I'm the innocent party and I see everyone else succeeding around me. That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and there's conflict and it abounds. That's how Habakkuk, this prophet of God, starts his book. In Colossians, this is... This is the message version. I picked the message version in particular because this, this demonstrates this passion. I want you to grasp this, okay? The message, if you're not familiar with it, it's basic. It's a paraphrase. I believe Eugene Peterson put it together, but it's a it's paraphrase. So it's, it's not scripture as, as, in a sense, written, but there's, there's the, the idea, and he, he writes this so well. He says, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. In other words, go after those things that, that Christ sees as important, that Christ is, is kind of laying out before you. Go after those things. And then, I'd love, this is my favorite part. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Okay, you can't tell me. That's not what we do. You cannot tell me that. I do that. We're just so absorbed with all of those things right in front of me. We're looking at our, down on the ground, shuffling our feet, saying, oh, what I'm dealing with here is so overwhelming. I can't handle this. And look what he says. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. 
see things from his perspective. That's hard to do. I recognize that. That's hard to do. But look at, look at how Habakkuk ends his. Somewhere along the lines, he came to grips with kind of what we read there in Colossians chapter 3. Habakkuk, this is how he ends. Though the fig tree does not bud, in other words, though I'm not getting any production, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep, so his circumstances haven't gotten better, Okay. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to tread on the heights. Somewhere Habakkuk gained a perspective that was beyond the stuff that was laying right in front of him. Look at this in Psalm 43. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 13, this is one of my favorites. Only six verses long, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure we're only going to see six. This is the Psalm of David, and he says, How long, Lord, can you relate to this? How long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? In other words, it's the whole idea that empty, it's just bouncing back. Where have you been through my suffering? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. I want us to grasp this reality. Okay? We all have these hurts. We all have stuff. If you're hurting this morning, number one, I'm sorry for the pain that you're hurting, but I want you to grasp this idea, this reality that I look at, what Jesus has revealed to us, this idea of pulling that veil away. And so even in the midst of our pain, he pulls that veil away and he shows us his glory. It doesn't make what's happening stop, but it gives us a different perspective. It's like, okay, Lord, you're leading me to believe something now. What is it that you're leading me to believe now? Help me to see your glory. Help me to see that which you desire for me to be changed in. And that's what everyone in this world can relate to because we all have pain, we all have suffrage, we all have hurt, and all of those things, it's difficult to keep that proper perspective. But yet what we see here is he allows these things to happen because he loves us in such a way that he wants to reveal his glory to us that we too can believe in him in that way. And as difficult as that is, what an amazing picture of the love that he has for us. He's given you some of these challenges, allowing some of these challenges because he knows that there's something better for you. He's allowing these challenges because he knows you can handle these challenges with his help. And I know that hurts, okay? We don't want it. <laughs> Let's see, can I choose a challenge, you know, with a lot of pain, or can I choose a happy day? Not a hard choice. But yet he gives it to us knowing you can do this. I'm with you. That whole I'm the light of the world. <laughs> Let's do this. Just like we goes back to Jerusalem. Let's do this. I'm going to ask Kevin and the worship team to come up. And we're going to sing... And we're going to praise the the Lord for the glory that he has revealed to us. And we will worship him together. Let's all stand together. Open up the heavens.
place your glory in our faith for looking to the sky descending like a cloud standing with us now Lord So may you see things from a new perspective. May you have the the ability to stop looking at your shuffling feet on the ground and be able to turn your eyes up to something greater that he's got going on and he's got a perspective for you. So I just pray that you'll help be able to see things from his perspective. Let me pray for you. Father, I give you thanks that you have a perspective that oftentimes we don't see and I just pray that you help us to get our eyes up off of our feet to be able to look upward Lord, to see things from your perspective. Oh, Lord, do that work that we can, as, as we say or we read in your scriptures, as, that we can be like stars shining in the universe in this community, that our faces can shine like Moses' face shone as he came down from the mountain, and likewise, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, that when this, great, this glory is revealed, when we choose to follow Christ, it's revealed to us, and then our faces likewise will shine, and I just pray, Lord, that we can shine in this community because we have gained a perspective that is a heavenly perspective. In Jesus' name, amen. We appreciate any help we can get when it comes to uh, chairs. And again, Kim is in charge. Isn't that right, Mike? That's right.